remember from Monday, we're looking at two-dimensional or planar motion right now. And there are three different coordinate systems we use to describe these things. Um, certain ones are better for certain problems. The uh, Cartesian coordinate system that we reviewed a little bit on um, Monday works great because you're so used to it. It's, it's a very, very familiar coordinate system. Today we're going to look at normal and tangential components, uh, coordinates. However, we'll find as we look at this that uh, using these coordinates does not make, uh, is not exclusive of using Cartesian coordinates at the same time. We're going to do some problems in normal tangential coordinate system, but we'll also look at the same problem in certain ways with the Cartesian coordinate system um, just as a way for us to look at something new and, and still have some familiarity with it. And then we'll look at uh, polar coordinate systems on Friday. Again, all of this is two-dimensional motion. For the Cartesian coordinate system, uh, as we've seen before from physics one and statics and the like, it's not a terrible, terribly big deal to add the third dimension other than it makes things very, very difficult to draw, both on the board and on paper. Uh, normal tangential system, normal tangential coordinate system uh, is a little bit more difficult to use in three dimensions. Uh, is generally left as a 2D coordinate system. And then polar uh, coordinate system is very easy to also use for three dimensions. Uh, actually, then becomes much more like what's called a cylindrical coordinate system. So the, the game goes something like this. This is very good, this normal tangential coordinate system is very good when the path is already known and uh, even better if the velocity is known along that path. So imagine we have some path upon which our particle, whatever it may be, can travel. At any instant, its velocity is tangential to that path. as it must be, because if there was any component of the velocity perpendicular to that, that direction, that would be a component of the velocity actually off the path. So uh, there's always a tangential velocity, uh, no <coughs> normal component to it. At any point in a curve like this, there's some curvature that can represent, some, some circle that can represent the curvature of the path at that point. And that may change as we go along the path. Both the center of curvature and the curvature itself might change. But at any instant, there is a a circle we could draw that represents the curvature of the path, perhaps very locally, but certainly uh, is a good approximation of what the path is doing in that, that little spot there. Obviously, at other places, there are other curves. So that center of curvature is moving almost as much as the, the object itself is, whether it's a, a vehicle, a plane, or a particle. <clears throat> that then defines for us the two directions that we have in the normal tangential component system. Normal is always directed towards the center of curvature, the local center of curvature, and we use the unit vector sign E in uh, uh, this is what our authors use, uh, and then put a little hat over it to represent it as a uh, unit vector. And then we have a tangential unit vector normal to that. 
and those are the two coordinate directions for a normal tangential coordinate system as defined by both the path and the direction of travel of the, uh, the object itself. So it's a moving coordinate system. It moves with the vehicle and depends upon what the curvature of the path is at any instant and the direction of travel is at any instant. If our uh, little particle is back here, then the normal tangential coordinate system would be like that and so on for wherever place it happens to be. So this is one that's useful if the path is known because otherwise there's no idea where these coordinate systems are because you have no idea where the path's going next and things can get uh, uh, terribly messy terribly quickly. All right. So that's our, our basic setup there. I guess I can add to it that the normal component of the velocity is always zero by definition of travel along a set path. So don't forget that little piece to it. Let's, uh, let's then start looking at uh, what we do have. So the velocity itself we'd write as the velocity vector itself, we'd write as whatever the magnitude happens to be and then always in the tangential direction. Now, a little bit bigger picture of our object at a point here with that velocity and a radius of curvature, which uh, for some reason we give the symbol rho rather than r, just to, just to spice things up a little bit. As the object moves along the path, that radius of curvature is going to be moving itself with some angular velocity, whatever the angle of measure is, it'll be moving with some, some angular speed theta dot. So the velocity we could write as rho theta dot in the tangential direction. That's no different than what we saw for rotational motion in uh, physics one where we had uh, V equals R omega for motion along a circle, or a rotational motion. That's just V equals R omega from physics one. So that's not like a, like a, a big break from something we've done before. Now the acceleration vector of that, depending upon what its particular motion is at any instant, can it be made up of two parts. It could be moving with a greater, uh, with a time changing velocity along the path, which would be then in the tangential direction. That's no more than what you see when you go around a corner in your car if the speedometer needle is moving in some way. Then you have this component of the acceleration. And you, you can observe this directly in your car on any corner you might be taking. There is, however, a normal component to that, which is nothing more than the centripetal acceleration that we also saw in physics one for any curved path motion. Uh, and that is, if you remember, v squared over r, but we're not using r, we're using rho, so it's v squared over rho, and it's always in the normal direction, which by definition is already towards the center of curvature, so this is indeed a plus sign itself. So those are the two components of the uh, velocity vector 
uh, sorry, the acceleration vector itself, just to separate those two. This being a linear, uh, well, sort of linear, uh, uh, translational acceleration along the path, and then this being centripetal acceleration, no different than anything else we saw before. In fact, what we did in physics one with uniform circular motion is V dot was by definition zero. Remember the uniform and uniform circular motion meant at constant speed, so V dot by, uh, by definition was zero. Uh, and I never even brought it up. We didn't, we didn't look at that component because in uniform circular motion, it doesn't even exist. So we never brought it up in physics one. For uh, any other form of that, we can also use this V equals R omega, uh, V equals rho theta dot. We can also change little parts in there if you so wish for other forms of that. Um, v squared, so with a row on the bottom would be rho theta dot squared as one form, or another form is v theta dot itself. Where remember, v is the uh, translational velocity itself. So what other parts do we have there? Oh, just this one. That this could be rho theta double dot, which is the same we use, as we used in physics one of this being A equals R alpha. Uh, for some reason in dynamics here, we don't tend to use omega and alpha. We use theta dot and theta double dot instead but they do mean the same thing. All right, there's the setup. Let's apply it to real life and find out why teenagers crash their cars so often. So imagine a car, your car, not my car because I don't drive recklessly is following a circular path with a radius of curvature <coughs> of about 2,500 feet, which is fairly typical for a curve in uh, an automotive curve, a very, very large uh, radius. Uh, we'll give it a speed of 60 miles per hour. I want to look at three cases. Constant speed around that curve. Increasing speed around the curve to the tune of 2.75 feet per second squared, and decreasing speed around the curve of the same amount. Find the acceleration. Do me a favor real quick because we're going to need that velocity, but we've got to make sure the units work right, so we need it in miles, uh, feet per second, so that it goes with all the other <coughs> units we've got there. So, how many feet in a mile? Denver, of course. 
course, is the Mile High City. And then uh, one hour is 3,600 seconds. So we get all the pieces to cancel. So we get feet per second. around a curved path. Where the velocity at that instant is 88 feet per second. What then would be the acceleration? Given what I gave you a second ago, that it's V dot in the tangential direction plus v squared over rho in the normal direction. Chris, you're back to paper. Setup one, what is V dot? It's zero. Time rate of change of the velocity. The velocity is constant. The tangential component of the acceleration is zero. The only component we have is in the normal direction, which is towards the center of curvature and of magnitude v squared over rho, where v squared is the 88 feet per second and rho is the 2,500 feet. So you could have just done that in physics one. There's no big shakes there. Comes up to be, I think, 310. 3.10 feet per second squared in the normal direction, which for an answer we can do nothing more than make a little drawing because it depends on, upon where it is and how fast it's moving at any time. Uh, not how fast, but what the path is defines the normal direction at any instant. But <coughs> two the second possibility, where we now have a component of V dot, what now is the acceleration? Same velocity at that instant, but there's now an X. Uh, and translational acceleration of the velocity, uh, change, time rate of change of velocity itself. Acceleration still has the same basic shape, it's just some of the numbers change now, which changes the overall acceleration. <coughs> if any. We can take a look and see what it means. Pardon me? Who wants to do the easy one and do the normal direction? It's already done. Because this hasn't changed any. All this changes. The V dot has changed. And it's now 2.75. And uh, for this part, we're saying that it's speeding up along the path. The speedometer needle is going up to the right, so that is positive. That is in the tangential direction. And 
uh, that's 310, because that hasn't changed any. And if we draw something to scale, they're not too different in length, so it's uh, approximately 45 degrees. And so the total acceleration is more something like that. The trouble, of course, being if the uh, grip with the road, if the friction with the road is not sufficient to supply that kind of acceleration in that direction, then the uh, driver is going to skid out. Doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, take a big stretch of imagination to, to realize if you're going around a corner and accelerating while you do it, you're more likely to lose traction and spin out. What's the magnitude of that? Comes out to be something like 4.14 feet per second squared uh, at, uh, at about 40, 40 something, but a little, a little over 45 degrees. If, uh, we use that as our angle. So you were at 310 feet per second, just going to constant speed, just picking up speed a little bit, and the acceleration is is climbing, and it's uh, now not normal to the to the path. Remember the uh, friction uh, has got to supply that the force to supply that acceleration. All right, if you would please, you do part three. And sketch it like I did with that other one. I'd like you to do is this, but also the sketch for what it looks like for this case. Case three, where there's deceleration along the path. there should be fairly quick shouldn't it should be fairly quick
about uh, a three minute problem, right, Phil? That you see it? Yeah, no. How has the normal component of the acceleration changed? We're still looking for very same things we were looking before, just the number changed a little bit. How has the normal component changed? Not at all. The velocity hasn't changed, the radius of curvature hasn't changed, the normal component hasn't changed. So it's what the, it's the very same thing it was before and has been for all three of the parts. How about the tangential component? <coughs> same one we had before, it's just not in the positive direction but in the negative direction because it was a given as a deceleration an acceleration uh, opposite the direction of travel. So that's the tangential component. And the magnitude the same as before. Oops, also in feet per second. In fact, the angle would have been the same only in this direction. So either of those cases, if you feel like you're starting to slip <coughs> out of a curve, accelerating and putting on the brakes, either one might make things worse. If you're already slipping out, uh, you should probably stop doing the physics calculations and settle things with your maker. So good luck. I'll read about it in the paper on Monday. No, don't do that. It's the worst thing is to ever for a professor to find the students' names in the paper. It's never good. So stay out of the paper. All right. Any questions about that or life in general? Since I like to expound on both. Why is the sky blue? You have, to, you have to get the MIT videos on that. Okay. Another problem then? All right. Nothing changes other than the, uh, the geometry of these problems, but it's still the case for any one of these that the velocity vector is whatever velocity it has, and it's only in the tangential direction. And that the acceleration vector is made up of the two components if there is tangential acceleration. And uh, the only way we wouldn't have normal acceleration is if we either are on a straight path or have no velocity. Either one of those are fairly boring problems for normal tangential components. All right, so here's another problem, kind of a UPS type problem. Looking from above, we might see a package delivery system, some kind of conveyor belt that could look something like this, where packages move along the conveyor belt get to a point, have to do a bit of a corner, and we want to make some analysis about that. Again, uh, the normal tangential components are fairly nice for situations where the path is known. So we'll call that point A and this point B. Some of the specifics. Let's uh, say that distance is three meters and the radius 
of the turn is two meters. Okay, starts from rest. Given a couple things, um, has a acceleration there that is constant throughout of two t feet uh, meters. Sorry, point two t meters per second. So as time goes by, the acceleration is increasing. So not a constant acceleration situation. And we want to find the acceleration at B. If uh, friction isn't sufficient at that point, you're going to lose the package. All right. I'll do the easy part. Because no matter where it is, that part's already given. For this first section, what's the second part of the acceleration? For this first three meter section, Y zero. It has velocity. It's going to be moving all the way along there. The radius of curvature on a straight section is infinite. So we need to come up with the velocity there so that we can then put together the uh, acceleration at that point. And it will have a normal and tangential component to it. And it, it doesn't really matter if the uh, curve keeps going around. At that point, it has curvature. So we need to figure out those two parts. acceleration at B, we need to come up with we need the velocity at B, curvature is given. Um, that's the only part we need, I think. Oh, well, we'll actually need the uh, the acceleration at B in the tangential direction because that does change, so we'll need that uh, this is given, but as a function of t. So we have to remember that's changing as well. We'll need both of those uh, by the end. Acceleration in the tangential direction at b. That'll just be a function of, of the time. whatever time it takes to get to uh, point B. Okay. How can we do that? How can we find either one of those pieces? Starts from rest. We know it's acceleration as a function of time. So uh, we need to figure out its speed at the end of the track and its acceleration at that same time because it is time varying in there. So do what, John? Derivative. We have v dot as a function of t. Um, 2t, and we know that that's dv dt. So if we integrate zero to the 
velocity of v, dv, zero to whatever time, I guess I could call it tv, we don't know that yet. So we can do that integration. Will that help us find TB? That will help us with the velocity at B, but only if we know this time at TB. So will this help us? Remember, this, this given acceleration is all the way along the path. So this would certainly help us find the velocity at B. In fact, this side just integrates to that since V1 is zero. Uh, we can't finish this integral because we don't know the time at which it reaches the bottom. So what's next? stop and restart my tape and over time. Chris, you're busy. You got some idea to share with us? Integrate again. Integrate what? Integrate again. Integrate. Well, this will give us the velocity as a function of time. I guess if we want to keep it a little more generic, we take the actual limit off and just put it on when we're ready. And we can integrate that again because that will give us then the distance from zero to s as far as it's going to go. And now then we can solve for that because we do know how far it's got to go. It's got to go three meters plus a quarter of the turn of a two meter circle. So this distance, SV, is known or easily findable. And then that can lead us to finding that, dis that time TV at which it makes the, uh, comes out of the loop. So a little bit of integrating to do is all. If you don't mind, you love that. This one integrates to 0.1 t squared, evaluated between zero and any time t. And then that. you put in there and integrate again. So that's your task. Uh, that distance, I'll give you while you work in. meters. That's the entire distance from the starting point all the way to the exit point at B is 6.14 meters.
first one's integrated for you. We now have the velocity as a function of time that you can integrate again for the distance. If you get that time, feel free to check with me on it so you don't go farther. Because my numbers are never wrong. Got something? Yep. Yep. Isn't that scary if we agree? No, that's not quite right. What do you have, David? Uh, no, double check. Yep. Yeah, double check, because there's no sense taking the wrong time farther. Yep. Good, I'm, I'm feeling so confident the number I actually got was right. Not often that happens. Nothing there yet. This integrates to what? 0 0.333 T cubed evaluated between 0 and T B. Well, I don't need to do that. I just put B on it. And then that gives us the total distance, which is 6.14 meters. So you can solve for the time it takes. 0 0.03. 0 0.03? Yeah. See, I've left space there for it. So you can solve for the time it takes to make the run from there to there with that given acceleration starting from 0. That'll give you the time. Then you can use that time to figure out what the translational velocity is, the tangential velocity. You can also find the velocity itself by putting the time back into here and then dividing by the radius of curve. And we can get all, all the parts of it then. And then sketch what it would look like at this point too. Blow it up a little bit. We've got the end of the curve coming down. And right at that point, we'll have some velocity VB. We can figure out once we have the time using the middle equation over there. We'll have some acceleration. tangential direction and some acceleration in the normal direction that we need to find. Let's see how the magnitudes compare. So now, since that equals 6.14, you can solve for the time. Yeah, 5.7. That's how much time it takes to get down to here. Now, that will give you the tangential acceleration at that point. You can also use that to find the velocity at that point, which you use to find the normal acceleration. Tangential is 0 0.2 at 5.7 seconds. So what's 
that uh, 10 for 11, 1.4, 1.14, yeah. So that's this component. Is that the right direction? It is, it's an acceleration along the path rather than a deceleration. <coughs> a n is b squared over rho at that point. And v squared, v we can get. Sorry? Is that the So you can figure out the velocity at the end there, 3.24 or meters, yeah, meters per second. Anybody getting different numbers in these that are right so far? So 3.24 meters per second squared over the radius of curvature meters and it comes out to be 5.24? Uh, yeah, 5 so, Okay, close enough. Um, you're not going to want to put things right in the limit on any of these things anyway. Uh, going to get built in a factor of safety. So, um, about five times more acceleration to the center of the circle than there is to the uh, along the path, so pretty severe uh, normal component compared to the tangential component. All right, but again, the sketch uh, in terms of the coordinates at the point of interest, which, if we wanted to, since it is so regular, could be expressed in x, y coordinates as well. But need not be, it's, it's a very regular problem. Okay, back there. David, all right with that one? Yeah, I forgot to make it make the circumference by, by four. Okay. So that was what was wrong with my time. Okay. All right, a couple more quick problems, we'll be all set. So imagine a jet takeoff path follows something like that. Might as well use my jet. <clears throat> 400 feet per second. And acceleration that they got maybe from radar or something of 70 feet per second squared at an angle of about 60 degrees. So find two things. rate of increase of its speed and find the radius of curvature. All right, with those first words, rate of increase of speed, what are we looking for? Is that agreed? That is the speed, that is the V, we're looking for the change in that. We're looking for V dot there. And of course, here we're looking for rho. Now, 
this is this is one that you can overthink if you're not careful because you're given some uh, pretty useful information in that at the point where the plane is the acceleration is already given and then you can break that into tangential and normal components the tangential component is v dot the normal component is a function of the radius of curvature itself Skip lunch too. Where's your monster cola? Right, everybody okay? Gonna start? Looks good. So the tangential one's very easy. The normal one's just as easy. And that gives us the radius of curvature then. Travis, this is okay. David, you get it? Sure. Good check. I'm not sure about things, really. You what? You don't care about things? I'm never sure about things. Oh. That should be the change in velocity, and this should be rho. Well, I'll give you credit. It doesn't have units on the screen, but there you go. You're right. All right. Of course, this is 35 feet per second. Squared. The other part comes what? Oh, I didn't even write it down. What's 70 times sine 60? Do you have that? 60.6. This is 60.6? Yeah. And then you've got the velocity that was given the 400 feet per second. And you can solve for rho, the radius of curvature. Six forty. 
And if you're talking about jet pilots, you need both components of the acceleration uh, when you're trying to figure out the G's that a pilot is going to experience. You need both components of the acceleration because both of those are acting on the body. You may even have to take into account gravity as well. Though, uh, those are, well, those, those are about the same magnitude of gravity, same order of magnitude. All right, one last problem. All right, uh, I take my plane, use it to make relief drops. Of vital supplies. It's one of the, just one of the heroic things I do every summer. Take my jet plane out, drop things on people. So, given that the height is 1,500 feet from where the object is released, and the speed at release is 150 feet per second. I want to find two things. We'll label the drop point as A, the I guess the well the release point at A, drop point at B. Find the uh, acceleration at B and the radius of curvature at B. And as usual for these uh, projectile motion ones uh, and neglect their resistance. So I'll let you cogitate on this one a little bit because they're going a little bit more subtle piece to it that uh, might not be as obvious as uh, some of the problems leading into this. So presumably it will hit the, hit the ground with some Velocity won't be vertical. Hit the ground with some velocity tangential to the path of that moment. Well, that's the kind of thing you're going to need to find the, uh, the radius of curvature. Acceleration. I'm asking for the acceleration vector. So that's uh, unchanged from before. So if you can find this normal component, and the velocity at that time, that will give you the radius of curvature. And if you can find the acceleration in the tangential direction, that will give you the uh, component of it there. And then you can find both pieces.
ask you this. Maybe this will help shake it loose a little bit. At the instant of release, what is the acceleration vector in normal and tangential components? At the instant of release. It's not zero. No, it's not zero. It's no longer connected to the plane. The pilots just pulled the, the mechanism. It's just at the start, at the very, very instant uh, initial point of its projectile motion. What's its acceleration right there? Just gravity. Just gravity. In fact, that is the normal component at that instant. Tangential component of the, gra of the acceleration is, is zero. There's, there's no reason for it to accelerate. We're neglecting air resistance. Remember, it's released from the plane. The plane was traveling at constant speed anyway. What is the, what's the general acceleration vector the instant before it hits the ground? Can you tell me anything about the acceleration in general? Forget, forget the normal and tangential components for a second. What's the acceleration in general just before it hits the ground? Still G. Well, G grew a lot from one picture to the next. So the normal and tangential components that's the tangential component. The normal component is something like that. Tangential component you can find from the general acceleration vector if you can find that angle. Uh, maybe not theta because that's what we're using for the radius of curvature. If you can find that angle, you can then find either one of these components from the gravitational vector. How do you find that angle? How can you find this angle beta? Well, I'll let you cogitate on that a little bit. Try a three piece escaping over here. Since we got a moment for me to do nothing. Think about how you could find this angle, because then the two, the normal and tangential components, just come from the gravitational acceleration vector. Think back to physics one a little bit. Not 
be afraid to make a nice big drawing. Be shy here. Know what to do or not in the mood or don't know what to do. Or neither or both. You have the acceleration there too. Don't say it out loud. Well, you must have it if you have that number. So somebody can uh, take Chris for a little bit of his expertise, or you can go back on his tablet. Just wasn't working for you, Chris. No, it was so bad. Well, I was I was falling behind. The wrong Well, you can always set up the video and draw from there. So they have improvements coming out. It's still getting better. I think we just can type and then also draw like that. So should have whiteboard. Yeah, I guess. It, it looked like it was a very thick line in places. Yeah, the trouble with this thing is wherever I put the, the marker down, the actual mark it puts on the screen is about three-eighths of an inch away. So it's very difficult to put a mark where I want it to be. That's why I never bothered with that thing. What do you got, Tom? You're okay with what to do if you had beta, right? Because then you could just, it's just trigonometry, find these two components, then the two components are the parts we're looking for. Um, that would give you v dot, this would give you v squared over rho. Um, it's kind of right there in front of you. <coughs> if you can find the velocity vector at impact, you will have that angle as well. Because the velocity is always in the tangential direction. So at impact, Just, just before impact, hasn't actually hit the ground yet, because then it's a different acceleration problem. That velocity is made up of two components. A horizontal component and a vertical component. If you can find those two, you'll have the velocity vector and you'll then have this uh, angle beta. You can do it off the other angle if you wish. It's no, no big difference. How do you find the horizontal velocity of the box <coughs> just at impact? You don't remember. It's just you might insane. want to sue your physics one teacher for for uh, malfeasance. <coughs> Straightforward, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So keep it. Sit on it for a bit. Okay, I'll keep it a secret. Yeah. So yeah somebody I'll gets desperate and asks, offers you cash. <coughs> Does that help a little bit, Tom? This is just good old ordinary projectile motion from physics one. What's the velocity horizontal, <coughs> horizontal velocity of a projectile neglecting air resistance?
you, you can tell by the picture it's got some horizontal components because uh, neglecting air resistance, this would never actually be falling vertically. There'd always be some horizontal component. Is it not this? That's the velocity with which the box was released. And in a ideal projectile motion, that velocity never changes. Remember that? I think the old keys. I don't even have my own keys. I lost them. They were stolen. So your other task then is find the vertical component Then you can find the angle, then you can find the acceleration and the radius of curvature. <coughs> what is it, chalk dust? That didn't help, did it? Do you want that out of my skin in the winter? It's chalk, but I'll do it for you guys. out the vertical velocity. acceleration problem in the vertical direction. You know the distance, you know the initial horizontal velocity, you know the acceleration, you want to find the final, <coughs> final velocity. So by squared equals by initial squared, which is zero. 2a delta y. All right. There's everything. I can't give you any more without just handing it to you. So now it's a true get out of class early question. You give me the, uh, what was I looking for? The acceleration vector and the radius of curvature and your weekend begins. Chris, you already had it. Did you have it yet, Travis? Oh man, units. Uh, no, not that the radius of curvature. Something's wrong. You have something, David? I used another equation but it turned out the same consequence. Yeah, you, you can you can solve for if you're doing it in a constant um, acceleration equation, you can use one go come about it in a roundabout way. What am I looking at? Is that um, it here? Is that your velocity vector? No, here's the velocity. Here's the uh, by vector. I can't um, read that. Okay, denominator. Sorry. Help me out. Okay. Oh, man. Check any intermediate numbers as you go. For example, uh, you can check VY with me. There's VY. That's G. We have to take the square root. Can I take the square root of my head. What's that there? That's the radius? Yeah. What went wrong? I use the horizontal axis. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, remember, we practice strict segregation of those uh, horizontal and vertical components. Twenty-nine? Twenty-five, yeah. A little over twenty-five is what I have. Yeah, and then your uh, round off. So. so from this you can get that beta is about 25.8. Then you can use that to find the two uh, components. <coughs> That'll give you the uh, acceleration vector. You already have the angle. You can then find uh, radius and curvature. Have a good bit, two week, two minute longer vacation there, Travis. <coughs> Don't do something stupid in that two minutes. I waste it. You earned it. of significant figures. Oh, Give something now? No? Well, these were my final ones. I came up with those earlier. All of those? Row, potential. Oh, yeah, the, the radius of curvature is right, so probably everything else is too. Uh, now units, um, it's hard to tell, but I think those are the digits I had. VB. Yeah. Get a BB of 345 feet per second. You need that to find the radius of curvature after you found the magnitude of the normal acceleration. everything. We get a radius of curvature at this point. Remember, it's, it's a local radius of curvature, just something that would match the curve for a little bit there. And we get something rather large like that, 8510. What's that? A, a mile and a half. All right. Questions before we wrap up then? Okay, notice that that one 
worked uh, in both coordinate systems, uh, Cartesian and uh, normal tangential. Normal tangential works very well if you happen to know the path. Normal seems to work very well when you have windows and stuff so that count because. Uh, yeah, it would, because if you leave this in XY, you get acceleration in both directions, where in normal tangential, you'd only get acceleration, well, you'd still have acceleration in both directions, but you'd only have a wind resistance yeah. acceleration in one direction, because yeah. the drag is always opposite the velocity.